Just south across the border from the lowlands where Burns spent his youth, lie the fells, the Norse word for mountains, which form the Lake District. They nursed and nourished another poet who sought out the common experience, William Wordsworth. Wordsworth wrote down a lot of his work in this small cottage in Grasmere, which used to be a pub. He liked to use this chair with its flat arm to work on his poems. Poetry, once the preserve of the highborn or the high-flown, was being stormed by romantic and revolutionary language. His contribution to English poetry has been well and widely cherished. Wordsworth's contribution to the adventure of English is that in the preface to his lyrical ballads, first published in 1798, he stressed that poetry could be written in the language really used by men and didn't need a special poetic diction to express deep feelings. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening lustre mellow, through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow. Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy planted their garden here behind the cottage, with wildflowers they found on their walks rather than with cultivated hybrids. It was much the same with the language of his verse. Poetry wasn't supposed to use such simple language. Dr Johnson had said it clearly. The most splendid ideas drop their magnificence if they're conveyed by words used commonly upon low and trivial occasions, he said. And Johnson thought that Shakespeare had ruined the tone of Macbeth by using the word knife, a tradesman's word used by butchers and cooks, as he put it. Wordsworth warned that readers who were used to what he called the gaudiness and inane phraseology of many modern writers will perhaps frequently have to struggle in reading his work, struggle with feelings of strangeness and awkwardness. They will look around for poetry. Books. Tis a dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet. How sweet his music. On my life there's more of wisdom in it. And hark, how blithe the throstle sings, and he is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things, let nature be your teacher. Wordsworth was reviled for many years by critics and other poets for daring to bring poetry to the voice of the people, in a way to give it back to its bedrock of Old English. A few years before, in 1790, Thomas Paine had written The Rights of Man, also in the plain style, to demonstrate that simple language could carry precise thought. That a work of such influence on political ideas and a young poet who was to exercise even greater influence on poetic practice should agree opened up what's become a major thoroughfare for the English language. Despite its exhilarating taste for excess, obscurity and the arcane, its promiscuous nature now led English poetry and prose to the depth of meaning and feeling and nuance which could be mined from plain English. It's possible to imagine a world without the influence of Paine, Wordsworth and their followers. And one of its aspects would be that a language separate from ordinary English was the only language in which high thinking and profound feeling could be expressed. There's a sense in which Wordsworth kept English true to its old, tried and tested self. He saved and celebrated and gave lasting literary energy to the ancient language of ordinary speech. One impulse from the vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. <laughs>